Hi everyone, Matt Nixon here. Um, when I first mention this challenge to people, anybody, um, their initial response is always, well, why would you want to do that? <laughs> or secondly, how do you get to do that? Um, so what I always find is that that quickly follows with a question of disbelief and just wanting to the question answered first and foremost. Sorry, I'm just letting people in still. Um, the answer, I believe, is that there's been a few moments really in my life that have actually shaped me and how I kind of think about these kind of things. So the one I shared last time is about my granddad. Um, and this time, I'm going to share one about a fortune teller. So a fortune teller. I saw one when I was 15 years old um, in a... Uh, like a haven or a caravan kind of park and um, I was meant to be 16 but they uh, didn't know that so they might not be the greatest fortune teller in the world but um, anyway by the sides of that she told me amongst other things to um, get rid of my self-doubt card so get rid of my self-doubt card because I must have been very doubtful and answering stupid questions in a stupid way or something like that but anyway that has stayed with me for all of my life and I kind of use it quite a lot as well with decision making so um, with that everything that I do now I write in this book it's just a normal address book but A to Z I write down everything that I'm proud of everything I want to remember um, and everything that I've achieved so when i'm thinking a little bit of self-doubt again i can look through this book and hopefully it can inspire myself or realize to myself that i've led a full life so when i'm old and bold or you know I'm pretty much am already anyway then uh, uh, i can reminisce and um prove that i've got rid of that self-doubt so there we go so by luck um i saw an advert to the mongol 100 um, which is a new type of adventure that the company Rat Race were putting together. And I entered probably one of the first to enter, and it is their first, what they call their bucket list concept. So these are all big adventures all the way around the world. You've got kind of Panama across the um, rainforest. You've got across the desert. Um, they're adding things more and more and more into the mix. So I love the sound of it. And so naturally, just signed up, as you do. Um, so this race is to be done by any means, what they call it. So you can choose basically the method that you do, the discipline. So there's a choice though of running and trekking, uh, skating or cycling. And being completely honest with you, I actually chose what I thought was the easiest one, which was skating. Not going to beat around the bush with that one. But even so, um, it was definitely going to be a challenge and the definition of challenge is uh, when I can work my computer so the definition of challenge is something that needs great mental or physical effort in order to be done successfully and therefore tests a person's ability so um, that is essentially what it means but I think there's another level to that as well I think that um, personal challenges so the ones that are hard for you personally I'm not talking about anybody else that's important the only things that are hard for you personally can change you or should be powerful enough to change you as a person and uh, or the very minimum that you can know yourself a lot better after you've done it than before you've done it and I believe that has happened with me so for those that listened last time, that's kind of where type two, take two comes from. So type two um, is um, alongside the type one fun is fun that's fun at the time. It's all a bit a good giggle. Whereas type two fun is the kind of um, it's, it's funny after it happened or it's the remember when stories that everybody's got. So the remember when this happened or that happened and you can have a good laugh at the end about it. And then the take two bit is obviously the sharing of that with you today, 
and so type two, take two. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. But through all this, I must point out very, very clearly that I'm not actually pretending or trying to be Bear Grylls, Ant Middleton, Ed Stafford, or a polar explorer, or an athlete, or anything of any kind. I'm also not saying that I've got any special skills, because I really don't. All I've done is I've made the decision to actually go for it and test myself, and to try new things, or something a little bit less ordinary. And I love doing that. It gives me loads of energy and I don't stop talking about it afterwards, like you all will see shortly. There's no doubt though that from doing these challenges as well, I do know myself far better. And by pushing myself out of my comfort zone, I believe it's helped me become quite strong mentally. And it gives me more self-confidence and my abilities for both work and when I'm at play or trekking or whatever it might be, cycling. Um, with a challenge like this, you can imagine so many questions start coming up. There's question after question after question, all popping into my head, all wanting answers. Um, but I find that most of these questions are all at the preparation stage, um, where, or the planning stage. When I'm actually in the challenge itself, I'm actually quite um, relaxed, feel quite in control. Um, which hopefully means I've made good decisions in my planning method along the way. But the key thing is that I've tried to manage the manageable and not consider managing the unmanageable because that, as always, is impossible. But all of it, it's not necessarily difficult stuff either. It might be something daft like um, forgetting to cut your toenails or buying the wrong pair of socks or something like that. Um, but something little that actually snowballs into a bigger problem. So it might not be something big. But for me, this preparation, sorry, this challenge in particular had three uh, angles to the preparation. And that was kind of the ab uh, ability side or physical side, the kit side, both on and off the ice, and the logistics actually to get my head around along the way. So I decided that. Um, kit was most definitely king in this situation so for those that don't know mongolia you can see behind me on the screen there is a long way from the uk and it's pretty long way away from everywhere i must say um but um it's it can be down to minus the week before we were there it was down to minus 35 degrees um so it was ridiculously cold um, before we went. Luckily when we were there it did actually warm up a fair bit but um, the uh, it did actually wear up quite a lot but um, and I can't really plan for it was still minus 15 minus 20 and I can't really plan for anything like that anyway unless you've got like a walk-in freezer or something um, which obviously not many people have. But um, you could be right in saying that I could obviously try my ice skates out, which I did do, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But it's completely different to what lay, lay, lies ahead in, on ice skating rink. And all the kit I had, I call it kind of the Goldilocks test with this. So not too hot, not too cold, just right. And that is exactly what you've got to be in this particular situation. So for preparation I did, I went along... Um, there's a test pilot trip that went out with not many people uh, involved and they did some blogs and they took some photos. So I zoomed in really uh, tight in to the, um, to the photos so I could see exactly what make of shoes, for example, people were using or what kind of kit they were using, basically trying to answer all the questions I could along the way. Um, on other trips I've done, um, you can also have a, you tend to have a really good route, like a real defined route. Now with this, obviously we did have a defined route because we kind of knew that it was going to be down a lake like that. So the white bit is the lake. So we were gonna traverse from right from the north end down to the south end. And um, we kind of knew what was gonna happen. We knew it was gonna be flat, so there's no elevation involved, but you couldn't really, it, it was kind of too complicated almost to kind of work out or, or compute what exactly what challenges you were going to get at the time. 
So I struggled um, really hard to make decisions on what kit to take. And um, I changed my mind loads of times on what kind of stuff to bring, what to put in the suitcase. The only solid bit of kit, if you like, that I had that I definitely needed was my blades of the boots and the boots. Or so I thought. <laughs> because um, around December time, um, it was when plans started to unravel a little bit in my preparation, let's shall we say. So in the last 25 to 30 years, I've been ice skating once which was uh, Winter Wonderland in Hyde Park. So for everybody knows, it's just a ice rink that's there for about a month of the year before Christmas, I think, or around Christmas time. And that was about it. Um, so headed to the local ice rink with the family one weekend. Uh, before we came off the rink, I went for a big finish, you know, as fast as I could around the rink. Um, and someone stepped out on me right at the last turn, because quite obviously it wasn't my fault. No way it was my fault. And um, ended up in a and &E, as you do. Um, I'd broken my wrist. So with less than three, four months to go, uh, I couldn't really do any, go anywhere, really, rather than uh, let alone ice skate 100 miles down this lake. So talk about having to adapt. Now, thankfully, all the kit that I'd kind of got would obviously be fine for walking. Uh, just kind of trekking gear, really, but loads of layers. So that's what I decided to do pretty quickly. Well, if I can't skate it or the docks won't let me skate it, then I'll just walk. Quite an easy decision. Um, but it also meant that any kind of preparation that's physical or ice skating or anything just became far harder. And I couldn't really do any physical um, preparation. So all I ended up doing was going for brisk walks up and down the canal in Stratford. Stratford. I live in Stratford upon Avon. So doing brisk walks up and down there, which was, it was a straight line, I guess, which is about the only similarity you could probably get with it. But um, I didn't have any other choice. And uh, being perfectly honest, it took the pressure off quite a lot, which, um, which actually was quite good. So eventually I got the cast off and tentatively went to the rink with my boots. So I thought, great, here we go. So I put the blade on. Here's the blade, if I can get it in the picture. It's quite big. They're a lot bigger than a normal blade. And basically, it unclips like that. And then you get your boot. You put that in the front of the toe, like that. And then you close, snap that shut. And there you go, your boot's on the blade. And it is only attached, as you can see, hopefully, just with the toe of the boot. So the back end of the boot actually isn't attached at all. So I attached these very same boots to the blade, went onto the ice, and the ankle collapsed completely. Uh, they just weren't strong enough. They're more, I think, skiing boots than, um, than skating boots. So they collapsed. So 10 days to go, I did not have a pair of ice skate boots. So quick call to the supplier, managed to sort that out, and they were really good. They sent me another pair of these which you can see is a little bit more um heel support maybe on that so these were fine and i put tried them on put the blade on just stood up in the house with them and they were a lot firmer they're a lot better fit and they were smaller size as well which uh, which worked so that's the same fitting as like a cross-country ski um and that's the only bit of kit really that i had nailed down and even that went a bit wrong um, what I did find with them is that the blade is so much bigger and for my level of ability I could not do a skid stop so I could just about manage a skid stop with normal ice skate boots but for these you actually I was doing snow plow breaking so that's how big the kind of blades were that's kind of the only way I could really stop um, just doing a snow plow it looked a little bit weird but uh, anyway uh, the length of time I spent on the ice rink before going to Mongolia was 20 minutes so 20 whole minutes of preparation and uh far from ideal i'm sure you would agree but in my head i was still happy if i was going to walk it if i couldn't do it i couldn't do it so uh share the screen again and we've got a couple of photos got lots of photos uh to show you a little bit of video so um see what uh we think so we flew via Aeroflot, or most of the group did, obviously from all over the world. And we landed in Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital of Mongolia. 
So you can see there that Ulaanbaatar is not the cleanest of places. Um, they do have a number of power stations that kind of circle the uh, city. And they actually, in the winter, they allow locals or the, the Mongolians burn coal. So by default, you're going to get quite a lot of smog. Um, but it did feel um, worse than that before we went outside that um, we actually, uh, a lot of us, didn't have any ba our bags show up. Luckily, I had one bag. Um, Rat Race, the organisers, they had lots of bags that didn't show up. And one particular guy um, didn't get his bike. And another guy, Pete, who you may well have seen on the news, he did not get anything. Didn't even have a change of shoes. And considering that Mongolian shops don't actually sell size 13 shoe, which is what he was, then he was pretty stuck um, unless something showed up. But as we stepped outside of the airport, it was minus 19 and I started coughing straight away. Now, I kind of presumed that this was the cold at the time, but now you come to think of it, um, it could have been the quality of the air as well. I, I don't know. So, as I just said, um, the event was managed by Rat Race. So, uh, their MD, Jim Mee, who's actually on the call tonight. Hi, Jim. How you doing? And Rob Aitken, who's his second in command for this particular race, and I believe uh, a director of Rat Race as well. And then we had some um, local experts or fixers, I suppose you could call them, um, which was headed up by David Scott, who was a bear of a Glaswegian man, who um, is actually the honorary consulate of, of Mongolia for Scotland. I think I've got that right. And his colleague, Phil. So we're in really, really good hands and they got on the case really quickly to try and sort out um, all the luggage. So as we arrived, the day we arrived, we um, decided, we arrived at seven o'clock in the morning, so really early. So we had a whole day really where we could get doing stuff. So most of us booked onto a trip here. So we went to the Genghis Khan um, or horse statue, whatever they, um, can't actually remember what they call it, but Genghis Khan basically is the main feature of the statue. And, um, at that time in the morning it was really nice to kind of get out and everybody had just arrived all together so for everybody to get together it was a really good way of kicking the event off um, and the actual statue is really big although it doesn't really look it necessarily you can see the people down there by the um, entrance um, the the statue actually is apparently uh, it's about two hours out of, out of Ulaanbaatar but apparently it's at the site where Genghis Khan found his golden whip. So whatever that, whatever take of that what you will. But where he's pointing as well, or the direction he's facing is actually the direction of his birth, which I quite like stuff like that, where there's a reason for, for stuff. So the visit here was a big um, tick in the box. We are here and we're ready to go. This particular picture was taken at the top of the horse's head. So if you have a look, here you can see there's a little door in between his legs as it happens um, and then you can walk up to the end of the horse's head and then we were stood in that position so as i said um this was a great kickoff point for the trip because um we all got to meet each other we got to chat in the bus because it was a couple of hour journey in the bus uh, we went we also went to a um like a commune if you like of of families or in a in Gers, uh, to have some lunch and then we went to Turtle Rock which is um, a rock <laughs> that uh, looks like a turtle but, um, but it's impressively so as well it's big it's a lot bigger than what that looks um, so by the end of the day I'd actually it was very clear that I was in a different place in the whole world and uh, the way that their mannerisms or um, their customs are very different to what we're used to so by the end of the day, I had learned, number one, the windows of the bus froze on the inside that it was that cold. The second was that after initial worry about being ripped off, I have to say, in, um, the, at, at the Genghis Khan factory, uh, factory, at the Genghis Khan statue, I actually learned 
that 4,000 Mongolian Tugruk is actually a pretty good deal for a coffee and a chocolate bar, which roughly speaking is about a pound. And the third was that different parts of the world, as I said before, had different pastimes, habits, um, and ways of doing things. But Mongolians carry really weird things in the car. Now that is one of the biggest eagles I've ever seen, or buzzards, or whatever it was. And this guy basically just took them around the, the car, in the back of his car like that. He had two of them in there. Um, yeah, and carried them around looking for photo opportunities. So the next morning after this trip, we were all pretty tired and um, still no sign of our bags. Um, but the night before, I'd done a quick check, uh, saw what I had, what I didn't have. So the things I was missing was actually my skates or the blades of my skates. I had my boots uh, and my food. So something was really trying to tell me that skating this wasn't a good idea. But so I mentally began to kind of adapt my expectations and thoughts again to the prospect of walking it, which again would have been absolutely fine and it would have been a really tough thing to have done as well. Probably tougher actually. So that morning we flew up to a place called Marun, which is further up north. And you can actually see if you're still on my background, uh, in the background of this particular picture, you can see Marun there. Um, and then that's where we landed and that's what the airstrip looked like. This town is tiny or not even a town, village or commune, whatever you want to call it. There's absolutely nothing around this airport. Um, and we landed in one of these, which was um, uh, booked and organised by the Rat Race crew again. So then we got in a bus and headed further up north to Katgal, which was actually the southern part of the lake. And we got to the camp called the Injun Camp. And we stayed in these little Mongolian girls that you can see uh, on the picture. All the little ones there housed four people. Uh, we did actually have little beds in there as well, which was good. And we had a stove, thankfully. Um, the stove we found worked brilliantly and way too well because we got it burning and it was absolutely sweltering in there really quickly. But quite obviously, as the night went on, it burned down a bit or we weren't good with putting the stuff on or the fire fairies weren't good with putting the stuff on, then we'd get cold really quick. So thankfully my sleeping bag had actually made it in my um, one bag and I actually hired one. I hired a minus 40 bag, so I was pretty well covered. And it was a down bag, so it packed up really small and it was really light, um, which, was, uh, which was really useful. So, um, when we were in Catgal, the day before we went north of the lake, because we had to go um, obviously from south to north, drive it, and then skate it all the way back down. So when we were there, they had the ice festival. Oh, that's the inside, sorry, of the, um, the communal gear at the same camp, at Injun Camp. So on that picture, you can see the big uh, gear there, and that's inside of that. They're a massive inside. So we had the ice sculptures, um, or the, the ice festival, which um, you can see there, they had all sorts of things on the go. Some pretty impressive designs. Um, and as well as that, we could actually um, try out our skates. And in true um, Great British, this happened to be, style, we thought, or this particular person, JP, thought he would take on the locals. So take a look. I think you can see there that um, it was relatively obvious he was going to win that. In his defence, uh, he had the clip on skates and the other lad didn't, but um, I think he could have probably lapped him if he'd have really wanted to. Um, we got back to camp just before heading up north and uh, our bag showed up. Perfect. Everybody's other than Pete's. So he was having a nightmare. Um, and, but he, I didn't hear him complain once about it. He just got on with it, um, sucked it up, if you like. Wore his concrete boots. So um, when we headed up north, 
we took a few hours by minibus to get there. So um, driving in convoy up the ice was quite an odd situation. Um, that was my bag at the rush on. So driving up north on the, on the lake was quite odd. And as you can see, it is very, very surreal. In the background, we had a bit of reggae on the go. And the minibuses were just unbelievable. I don't think even, that, I, I might, must be wrong on this, but I don't think even they had any spikes in the tyres. I think they just kind of went for it. So we're all in these little buses, um, heading up north to the top of the lake. But on the way, it's obviously not as smooth as that all the way. You do have um, particular areas where you've got cracks in the ice. So you can see this picture here, we're having to negotiate around a seam or a crack or a wet seam in this particular case, I think, whereas there's actually water in the middle of it. So quite obviously, that's a little bit dangerous, uh, unless you obviously test it, which one of the guys did, got out of the car, a bus, checked it with a great big long metal spike. Um, and the way it cracks, I believe, uh, it's quite unbelievable this, but it's actually the, because there's so much water underneath it still, underneath the lake, then it's actually the moon and the tide that can actually still move in the water a little bit, along with the ice obviously goes cold, really cold, then it goes a little bit warmer, then really cold, and it's just that constant change. And that's what I've heard it is. I mean, it's quite unbelievable. But these little seams, they were obviously pretty big. And um, we sometimes had to go around like 10 mile detour around this place about particular hazards. So it was strongly highlighted to us, obviously, at camp at the safety meeting the night before we started, that um, if there's these particular flags in there or that particular seam, do not do this and do do this. So it was all very clear right from the beginning. The basic plan was and I'll try and show you on my screen. So the basic plan was, you can see the start was pretty much right at the top of the lake. Uh, day one's route was there. And then day two, you can see further down, we were stopping on an island uh, in the middle of the lake. And then further down from that, you can see another spot there. And then to the finish on day four. So. What I'd like to do, to try and do, is that um, we already knew that driving up there, um, that we would have so much huge expanses of ice that we actually couldn't skate. So thankfully, as you saw at the beginning, you can unclip these blades and you can walk it. As long as you get some um, crampons, I actually had two different types. I had this type, which are like, Everybody found out later, really, it was pretty heavy duty, these ones, and they were really hard on your feet. So walkers or runners, it would really pound the bottom of your feet. Whereas I had some of these ones as well, which I lent out to someone because I was obviously skating, uh, or hoped to be skating for most of it. So these ones are far less um, uh, shock onto your bottom of your feet. And it was pummeling some of the people at the base, if you like. If you imagine that bit of your palm being pummeled by metal all day, six hours, not pretty. So um, my skill level meant that I couldn't really skate over a lot of the areas that some of the others could. Um, there's two in particular, Brett and Kerry, who are on tonight as well. Hi, guys. Um, they were amazing skaters, and they did not have any issue in skating that at all. Well, I say that, they probably did, but in my head they didn't. <laughs> so, um, but some areas are like complete glass, just absolutely glass. And actually, as crazy as it might sound, these bits were actually slippier than everywhere else. And I'll talk a little bit about that again in a minute. Um, so, all participants were ready. I'm gonna share my screen again, got more photos. All the participants were ready at the start, uh, that was the um, camp at Tank, I think that's how it's pronounced, right at the north part of the lake. All had little girls up there as well. It's pretty much a Russia, that is, by the way, near enough. Lake Baikal's about, I think it's about 100 miles further north than that. Russia's biggest lake, or one of the biggest lakes in the world. So at the start, 
bit of a mix. Runners, skaters. There's Brett at the front, looking pretty good with his uh, red skates on, and Kerry not far behind him. Got the one biker, and I think I'm probably at the back somewhere, <laughs> most likely. Um, but I was there. That's the main thing. So we were told the rough route for each day um, because actually it wasn't quite as easy as just go straight and stop. And we had actually every 10 kilometers or so, we had some uh, check stops or sorry, checkpoints where I might have a cup of tea, um, crisps, biscuits, whatever, um, other bits and bobs. And there was literally just parked in the middle of the lake and we'd be doing that. So it was either the buses we'd be looking out for or it would actually be uh, flags. So I had these little flags that were uh, screwed into the ice. And you can see on the main picture, that probably wasn't that far away. But from 10 kilometres away, it's really tough, if not impossible, to see that flag. So you've just got to aim roughly in the right direction. And then eventually you'll start seeing it. And then on the right hand side on the picture, that's when it starts to come more into view. Now, um, day one, obviously, first 10k. Uh, I don't mind admitting I fell over quite a lot, but I was learning quite a lot as well. So um, in a way, by falling over, I got the monkey off my back and um, I was able to just enjoy it. I wasn't worried about falling over as much. So, but after you come around the first little turn, there's a little peninsula we kind of were hidden in on the first few bits. Then you actually start seeing the uh, full expanse of the lake. Now, you can see there, once you get around that little peninsula, we're talking right at the top, then it all opens out. And I'm going to try and get you to imagine what that must look like. It's pretty difficult, but give it a go. So before I do, I'm going to give you a few facts. So Lake Cobsgall is one of 17 ancient lakes in the world. It's actually 1,645 metres above sea level, which... For those of you in the know, that's 300 metres higher than Ben Nevis, which is um, UK's biggest, oh, sorry, tallest mountain. Uh, it's roughly 100 miles long. It's more like 85, 90, but the way the route we were doing, we would quickly add up to 100. And it's about 23 miles wide, 23 miles across this lake is. The average depth is 138 metres. And the deepest point is 267 metres deep. It holds 70% of Mongolia's whole supply of fresh water and 0.4% of the whole world's fresh water in this lake. You don't have to treat it either. So we're told you could drink it, although we did boil it up before we did. The ice forms every winter and it goes down to about a metre, one and a half metres. Um, in thickness and it's there till around June every year. So looking at that picture there, imagine that you're on the ice. So take a good look at it. Close your eyes if you want to, if you're that way inclined. But basically imagine you are stood right in the middle where that guy is. You're in the middle of nowhere. You can't see anyone or hear anything. You've got a huge expanse of absolutely nothing. It's a huge area of ice. Not a sound. All you can feel is a cold wind blowing across your face, which actually starts to freeze the water in the corner of your eyes. Each breath in through your nose burns your nostrils. Ice starts forming on your eyelashes when you blink. You move your feet under the ice and all you can feel is complete solid ice, like concrete. And looking out in front of you, you've got crazy paving, little tiny cracks weaving in and out and round, forming all the different parts of the lake. And through it, where it was clear, jet black. In front of you, all you can see, you can just spot it, is a peninsula that you're aiming for. That's your goal for today is to get there. On your right shoulder, you can see a host of huge mountain ranges 
all framing the back of the lake, sorry, the side of the lake, and framing a bright blue sky. So that was what you had to look forward to each day on the ice. Just completely otherworldly. That, of course, and snotsticles. You had to look forward to snotsticles too. So um, as you can probably make out, the skating was an absolute blast in places, but really, really hard in others. Um, the surface was just so changeable. You're on constant guard throughout the whole day, picking a route through hazards and round hazards and bits of snow over little ditches. Um, but the black ice was really good to skate on. Like I said, if we go back one, you can see what I mean by just black. And some of the expanses without the cracks were just huge expanses of black nothingness. And that was the really slippy stuff. But even then, if your blade just caught one of the edges um, of this ice, one of the little cracks, it could grab it, and that was it. You were down, flying Superman across the ice for meters. Not so funny when it's happened to you, but it is quite funny when you saw someone else do it, as long as they weren't hurt, of course. But other areas of the ice was to try and give you a bit of an idea. This is kind of how it sounded. It was like a train track the whole way. You can hear every little of imperfection. That was the island I'm going to talk about in a minute. I was obviously going slow because I was recording the uh, this video. What I tell people anyway. <laughs> so you can get an idea what you had the sounds you had to put up with. It's like going on a train track the whole time, just crack, 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 and then hope that your blade didn't catch. But there were some areas that was just horrendous. You just could not skate through. They're like jagged, jagged knives almost pointing up through the ice. Other areas was like cartoon squares. You see ice on cartoons, cartoon people falling off and whatnot. Um, it becomes, yeah, like a cartoon. Um, other areas were a little bit more pretty than that, like ice flowers. Now these fields of ice flowers, I think that was mainly on day four, you could just see them as far as you wanted, all the way out, it's just a bed, a whole area of these kind of things. And then generally nearer the shore, you'd get bubbles in the ice as well, which I'm guessing when uh, the ice formed, it'd be vegetation or something that would be actually forming that in the ice as it happened. But as you went along, there was a lot of ditches to get over. And I'll play this short video because you can see the different again in the ice there. These were like trying little roads almost we were trying to follow. And there was Adam on his bike up in front. You can see in a second that there's ditches that just pop up that you have to cross. Now the biggest bonus, the biggest bit of kit that I took, was the best bit of kit that I took, was my poles. These are just standard trekking uh, telescopic poles with a tungsten lid over the top, oh, sorry, tungsten nib. You can see going over there. So basically I'd used a, like a tripod almost to um, get over the, the um, I even comment on it, <laughs> these poles are amazing. So if I hadn't had them, I'd be in some serious, serious bother because they just helped. I could push myself along with them, I could keep myself up with them, and so on and so on. But even though I had these poles, I still did fall over. And that picture there, a little bit blurred, but I even started sellotaping uh, my uh, hiking socks to my arms with some um, tape. And I'm not sure quite what hurt, hurt much. It worked, but um, when I pulled the tape off, it hurt even more. Um, so, small price to pay, I guess. So, um, when we were on the first day, um, I'd passed the last checkpoint. So, um, 
done about 30 kilometers. I think we did about roughly 40 kilometers a day. Um, I'd spotted what was the first end of the first stage in the distance. What I thought was the first stage. I saw this little flag and I could have sworn that there was a guy sat in a deck chair watching and waiting at the finish line. So I started rushing. So I saw I'm near the end, I'm near the end, started rushing, panicking, trying to get quicker, wanted to get over with. But I kept falling over. So every time I rushed, I fell over more. And then after about half an hour, I actually focused and saw that it wasn't the deck chair. It was actually a minibus. <laughs> it was a minibus with people walking all around it. And um, just complete uh, optical illusion at its absolute finest. And then... I don't know what to, what to do from that. I obviously tried to get there still as quick as I could, but tried not to fall over at the same time. But stage one or day one was over. And I was really happy with um, how my, my kit choices had gone. So all the work, or all the worrying or whatever you want to call it, of uh, thinking about what kit to take had paid off. Now, I was actually really warm skating it. I was maybe even too warm. And I knew that it was something that I really need to watch out for because... Um, and I needed to be disciplined that if I was hot, I needed to stop. I needed to take a layer off and put it in my bag. If I'd have carried on and getting too hot, too hot, too hot, and started sweating a lot, um, then if I had to stop, then obviously all of my sweat, or no word, word to say it, would have freeze. And if that froze and I couldn't skate anymore and I had to long walk, that would not be a good idea. So I had loads of layers. I had, I think, two thermal layers, a uh, fleece, a uh, jacket that had all pit zips I could open on the side. And then the bottoms as well, I had trousers that had thigh vents on it. So again, I could cool down if I wanted. But the thing was discipline of stopping and sorting yourself out early enough so it wasn't a problem. So to be able to do this, I actually had loads in my backpack I carried at the same time. I had um, a flask with drinking. I had my change of shoes because my... Um, Skate shoes, I told you, were really new. So I thought they might rub if I wasn't careful. So uh, I took them with me as well. I took uh, spare layers, uh, down jacket, everything, everything, everything. Waterproof trousers, just in case, all sorts. And it was way too heavy. But I knew that I was covered for kind of every eventuality. And um, I play golf. So carrying that was way lighter than a golf bag. So maybe that's why I didn't really feel it as much. Who knows? So at camp, there's a lot to sort out. Um, the girls moved every day, and thankfully the Mongolian crew did that for us um, because there was quite it was a big task where they had to physically take them down and put them up. And inside, they were like TARDIS. Um, for the people in the UK, you'll know what I mean. Um, outside of that, if you think the Weasley's tent in Harry Potter... It was literally like walking in there and it is way bigger inside and all these girls than what you might think. So every night um, you can see we had a stove in there and there was probably, I don't know, I'm guessing maybe 12, 13 people that would sleep in there at night. Um, all picked our space. And then later on in the night, the Mongolian guys would come in um, and stop the fire and obviously join in with us. And um, we'd probably see, yeah, about... 15 people maybe somewhere around there um all in all so um when you're having a quick sort out of all your kit you can see you can hang up stuff and all the rafters of the of the thing there now i chose for the evening wear should we say i chose uh, an old um undersuit from scuba diving but you can see that the other traditional wear is what they call deals. So they got the deals on with a big belt, most of them did. Now these are really warm coats that some of the guys did actually buy. And then you've got these huge boots that you can see the chap on the um, left-hand side there. Got these huge boots that were really, really warm. And loads of people uh, bought those, including Pete. Well, actually, no, I think that was just for a photo, but um, you can see the kind of grand kind of stature that we have there with Pete. Now, what I find is that with trips like this, you get what I call the dead time. So you've done all the activity, you've done all of the um, effort, and then there's dead time. And normally that dead time can be 
a little bit of a pain, if I'm honest. Um, but because everybody was there, same mission, same idea, everybody got on, and it was great. So we had so many chats over the um, campfire or around the campfire at night, and uh, it was great to share the stories and learn what, how everybody found it on the day. Um, and when because the ground was really, really dry on land. Because we obviously didn't sleep on the lake. We slept on the side of the lake, thankfully. Um, and you can see the grass in this particular photo is really dry. So as they're building that, the grass sets alight. And it starts creeping out towards the end of the ice. And the ice stops it in its track, thankfully. So we did actually have a situation where one of the girls almost caught fire. But again, they sorted that out super quick. They were on it a load of ice put underneath that stove as well, this picture you saw um, earlier. So, as I said, in the dead time, it was great. You've got this kind of thing to look out for. You're having your food, a um, bit of hot chocolate, or I actually took um, chocolate protein powder with me, put some hot water in it, ready-made hot chocolate, perfect. But I slept really, really well every night. Um, the Mongolian crew that were there worked so hard, uh, solid as rock people, quiet and unassuming to begin with, but then they joined in uh, with us all at the end, or we joined in with them as well more at the end. Um, so after 24 hours on the lake, it did start to sink in a little bit more, what we were taking on. Um, and as normal, in the mornings, you have the morning ritual. So we went from this on the left hand side and rather nice automated toilet seat I had in my hotel and I'm sure it wasn't a five star hotel to that on the right where um, being Frank it was a um, well, actually that was Mark not Frank <laughs> not Mark sorry Marcus um, sorry Marcus um, you had a bin bag and a bucket so joking apart um, you, this lake is sacred to the locals. So you cannot leave any waste, human or otherwise, on the lake. It has to be taken off the lake because it's such a spiritual place. So day two's task was actually um, to head towards an island uh, in the middle of the lake. So this is the time when you can just make out right far in the distance on day two that you've got this island to head towards, you've got 40 kilometers to go, and you can just make it out. And it didn't get any bigger for a long time. So Jim and his crew um, headed out early every morning um, before light to check the routes for what you can see in front of you there. So whenever there was a situation like that, obviously we had a bit of a detour on our hands where the uh, ice had cracked. Now I put this picture up because you can see just how much the ice can move. You can see the tracks going into it and then it makes a bit of a divert where the ice has moved and then they carry on. And that for me is an amazing picture showing how just how much the ice um, can move. Now with this ice you could actually hear it crunching, popping, banging um, in the day and, and actually through the daytime as it warmed up a little bit. But walking on the ice was completely uh, draining. And um, it, it took so long to actually get anywhere that it showed how tough it was actually for the walkers and the runners um, to face that distance when there's just miles of snow and ice um, all along the way. So it was music to my ears on this particular day. Um, I've missed a bit out, sorry. I will go back because it does have some importance. So, um, on the uh, lake, on the island, um, there was, we were told rough bearings to go to again. But when we got to the island, it was a hugely spiritual place. And um, I found that, along with everybody else, that was literally on the left-hand side, just behind our camp. So it was a little bit spooky, I have to say. And this island is known to be, um, or is, spiritual to the locals again. But I went for a bit of a wander further into inland and I saw these two um, animal prints. So I'm just wondering if anybody knows what animal prints they might be. Now, um, 
I can't see my chat easily, I don't think, on this particular screen share, but if someone pops it in there just for fun if they know what it is. But what it actually is, is the middle picture is actually a rabbit or a hare. So you can see there's a dot um, at the front, that's where its two front paws go. Two hind legs behind that in the oblong kind of or oval shapes, and its tail at the bottom. And the one on the right, I'm actually guessing as well with this because I had to Google it a lot when I got home. But this was like um, a drag line, and it was probably, uh, I don't know, um, 10 inches across, and um, just a drag line all the way. And the, what I couldn't surmise, it was an otter or something that was pulling along or walking along with its belly dragging along the ground. So there was stuff to see on the island when you got there. And there's actually a story connected to the island. So there was an, before the lake was there, there was an old hag. I'm just going to put you back to me for this, just for dramatic effect. So before the lake was there, there was an old hag and a, um, a boy and a girl. And they used to get water from a well. And on this well, they used to put a stone over the top of it every night to save it flooding, to save it overflowing. One day, the young couple, being young couples, forgot to put the stone on top of the water on the well and it started flooding and at that point when it was flooded a monster appeared as they do to have a drink um, the boy managed to kill it or slay it um, because um, it posed a danger and but what he didn't realize is that the lake was still flooding so he cut the top off the mountain and buried the monster under the top of a mountain. So to this day, um, the small island, there's a tiny island further south than this one we were on, um, that is known as the plug, because the old hag swam down to the bottom of the lake, put the stone back on the well to plug the, to plug the leak, if you like, or the, the flood. Um, and she died when she did that, um, sadly. And, um, the lake where the sorry the island where the monster was buried if you look out to the west of the lake there's a huge mountain range and there's actually a mountain called Mount uh, Urundosh which is a dead flat everything else is spiky and up and down and there's a dead flat bit of mountain called Mount Urundosh and that is what they believe they cut off and put in the lake so there you go um, so day three, we're on the island, woke up, um, and um, for us skaters, it wasn't a great day really for us. We had a lot of bad ice early on, um, which um, was, just trying to get my screen share back, which was a bit like that. So you can see it stuck out and stuck up. Uh, God, it's a bit of fun to begin with though, as I had to include this video. Uh, a little bit of fun to begin with, so we had these huge great big pieces of ice that we could kick, punch, whack with the poles, anything really, just to, uh, to have a bit of fun. So we had a lot of walking that day, which uh, obviously, as I said before, just seems to take forever. Mentally draining really. Um, and as Jim drove past in his van or the truck, um, he said, don't worry, Matt, there's a really nice piece of ice coming up. And um, in about a few kilometers, you'll be fine. You'll be able to skate pretty much into the finish. So I thought, brilliant. So shortly after I um, saw Jim, I uh, took this video. if I can get on it here we go so you can see the ice in the background there but listen to what I'm saying from the end have to take the skates off with a bit of walking which actually I'm quite pleased with 25 a month today have a look at this ice the mega oh you all agree Place. That's the island in the distance we came from this morning. 
and it's all going good. One of the bit days to go. So I used all going good, <laughs> only fell over once. So <laughs> I'd obviously started to lose a bit of concentration. Um, took my mind off the prize, if you like, a little bit, or mind's on the prize, rather. Um, so as you can probably guess, I got to this piece of ice that I thought Jim meant. I don't think it was where he meant. I'm not blaming you, Jim, don't worry. Um, but I got to this particular place. I thought, this must be where he means. So I clipped on my uh, skates and tried to skate it. If you could imagine that this was really quite thin, narrow tyre tracks, essentially, and they were really thin. So I could only just kind of get the uh, skate through the track. So I got to a certain point and my right skate caught like the snow on the side and turned my ankle in. And I didn't hear a uh, crunch or a crack, but I did hear like a ping or feel a ping in my ankle. I ended up uh, in a heap on the floor. And um, I sat there for a couple of minutes trying to assess a situation. I tried um, standing up after a little bit, um, just trying to push myself along with the poles. That wasn't going to work because it hurt too much. Um, so I took the skates off and tried to walk with that. That wasn't going to work. So I sat down again. I ended my boot to try and take my boot off. I couldn't take my boot off because it hurt too much. So I tightened it up really tight instead to try and brace it as much as I could. Um, and just had to kind of go for it and I kind of came out with the situation where in hindsight I had switched off you heard me say I've only fell over once today oh it's easy now oh yeah you know we're nearly home at 12 kilometers to go so I got complacent uh, lost focus and that's what happened and didn't listen to my own level of capability for that particular area and actually after that point the ice did get better and that was probably where Jim meant now, bear in mind, there's no one around at this point. There's no one there. Um, there's no way, way of getting hold of anybody. So I just tried to carry on. I uh, had 12 kilometres to go. But I had to try and keep my mind off my foot um, and try not to get, be sorry for myself or feel sorry for myself because um, I'd just get worse. So we've been told that there was wolves around. And you could see that from um, the side of the shoreline there, that um, we were close enough, so I decided to howl. So I was howling to see if I got any reply to any wolves in the background. I didn't, but um, someone did actually manage to get a wolf print photo um, at our campsite. He went for a run and, and found a wolf print. So they were around, but obviously with a group of 30 or so of us, um, they, wasn't gonna they weren't gonna hang around at all very long anyway. But more to the point, I was really surprised when I howled, I howled loud uh, out to the lake as well. And I did not hear anything. It sounded like I was whispering. It was because I guess it's because there's nothing for the sound to bounce off, for it to physically bounce back and hit you. It was just like I was shouting into a box. No one, no one would have heard it. It was really, really odd. I also to try and keep momentum up or I wrote some things in the snow like it might have been um, good luck or keep going or that kind of thing, um, which actually I knew people were still behind me, so they would have read it. Um, but also subconsciously, it was motivating me or underlining my effort to try and keep going. I was also motivated by little things like um, when I, what I was going to have for dinner at camp. Now, I really liked these dinner sachets or rehydrated packs or dehydrated packs so I was really looking forward to that when I got to camp so I started thinking about that I started telling myself that after this day I only had one day left and I'd done it whether I'd skated it walked it whatever and um, I also was visualizing the feeling that I would have when I finished uh, I use that quite a lot where I visualize the feeling if I visualize what it'd be like to give up now then that's never a good feeling Whereas if I visualise the feeling, what I'm going to get when I finish, then that's complete polar opposite and it keeps me going. And I've used that quite a few times. I also knew that I'd raised loads of money for charity. Um, and on the run up, I'd actually spoke to three different radio stations, uh, newspapers, um, 
cut on a big event with 300 people attending to raise some more money. Um, and I went on, um, and they would want to know how I got on when I got back into England. So there was basically no way I wasn't going to do it. And also I had a really big reason why I was going to do it. So that for me is important. If I've got a big reason why, then when things like this happen, it does make it far easier. Now, um, as I was on the way to the finish of this particular stage, Dan, one of the walkers or runners, um, caught me up and uh, he actually had messed up his knee really badly. And he actually popped his kneecap back into place while he was on the ice. So that's pretty hardcore. Um, and we ended up arm in arm or shoulder to shoulder, whatever you want to call it, helping each other to the finish. And that is what this race had become. No one actually cared where we came. I don't think really anybody was really counting. I think Dan Jones, the other Dan, might have been counting. But there wasn't really many people that were counting and they weren't bothered where they finished. But the camaraderie and the team uh, bonding that we had was so strong that all anybody wanted everybody to do was to finish it and um, do it together, which was absolutely amazing. Um, so the camp at the last night, um, I managed to get my boot off to, and I showed the medic, um, Nick, who uh, casually said, you might want to get some ice on that, which uh, I didn't have far to go to get any ice. So, uh, so I managed to get some and put that on for a couple of hours. But there was far more people than just me suffering. There was a lot of people. I just seen that Masseuse Extraordinaire, Jill Watson, joined us. She was one of the key people to get people back moving the next day. Hi, Jill. And um, that was what my ankle looked like when I took my boot off. Um, that was actually the day after. But normal ankle, bottom photo, and bad ankle, top photo. But as I said, there was people were struggling with backs, with huge blisters, um, legs, all sorts of stuff. But you couldn't go wrong with a view like that. That was the view from the last camp. So that was sunset. And again, as I said before, everybody sat around the campfire, having a laugh, having a chat, sharing stories from the day um, and relaxing, obviously, most importantly. So after that night, that night was especially cold. I think I was told it was, went down to minus 24, something like that which actually followed on to the next day with wind as well. So it was really windy and really cold the next day. Um, and they actually ended up getting, um, sorry, I thought I'd put a photo in. There's um, on, the, on that morning, the next morning, um, there was actually the, it was that cold, the, the Jeeps actually froze. So they actually had to light a fire underneath the Jeep or the um, support truck to get it started. And that's pretty amazing. So um, the next day, it was clear that my ankle was still pretty uh, done for. So I chose to wear my trekking shoes or my trainers um, and walk it. And it was about 30 kilometers, 35 kilometers um, and carry my backpack. But in my backpack, I carried my skates, trusty skates, which obviously weigh a bit, uh, my boots, my helmet, um, everything I needed really to skate it if I felt I could because um, I wasn't I wanted to try and finish on my skates um, so I set off walking and I had a 12k backpack I actually weighed it after I finished 12k is way too heavy for things like this kind of thing but again I didn't really notice it at that point in time so um, I started walking with Pete who as I said before, turned up, or sorry, he didn't turn up with nothing. He didn't have his bags turn up. So he walked and ran the whole race. This was, he finished it in a pair of jeans and a pair of brogue shoes. So he's been on the news quite a bit from doing that. The rogue in brogues, uh, absolutely top guy. And again, I didn't hear him complain once. He obviously wasn't happy, but he did it. He sucked it up and got on with it which is kind of what I tried to do. Now, he was quicker than I was. So he left me for dust after a short while. Um, so I power walked as much as I could um, on a pretty messed up ankle. So um, I just got my head down and got on with it because that was the only way to do it, 
to get it over, I had to go quicker. So with that, um, just to try and bring it back to actually what was happening, I had 30 kilometers to go on this ice and all you can hear is crunch, 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 crunch for six hours, six and a half hours of walking with that crunch with my crampons on. Um, and all these checkpoints, they just seem to take forever, so much longer than it did on the skates. Um, 10 kilometers on my skates, I'd be lucky, maybe an hour, hour and a half, whereas walking it, you'd be two hours, no problem, just by walking it, especially hobbling it. So, but I didn't want to stop for long, I just kind of grabbed a few bits and then carried on, because I didn't want to stiffen up. My ankle had taken some painkillers uh, and I wanted to just get on with it. Luckily, I'm quite happy with my own company. So I didn't actually, the whole length I was there, I didn't use any music, nothing on an iPod, no, I, no book or anything like that. Um, I was quite content though. Um, but you could feel uh, and start to see over time that I was getting closer to the finish because you started getting more and more into this kind of crazy happening, <laughs> which certainly made me laugh um, and they were doing that for ages just pulling themselves along so you were slowly coming back to a bit of um not reality what's the word i'm looking for back to uh, where the buildings are <laughs> sorry it's getting a long night what was that donna society back to society thank you so um I passed a couple of frozen boats, which actually were secured in the lake um, as we were going along. Someone joked, I don't know if it's true, that one of them was like the Mongolian Navy, um, which I've no idea if that's true, but it's probably just someone taking the mick out of me. Um, and um, went over the finish line. I shook Jim's hand. He gave me that medal. Pretty much of a boster of a medal. Um, and a few hugs all round. But... Weirdly and really strangely, I didn't really feel a big release of emotion that I expected. I, I've cried at the end of races before, uh, a rat race event up in Scotland, a uh, marathon I did. You know, I, I have done that. I've become kind of emotionally attached with it, shall we say. Because um, I'd done this event, I'd been talking about this event for 12 months. Um, I'd been, everybody had been asking me questions about it for a year. So I thought, that I would walk over the line, I'd be a mess. But honestly, I walked over the line. Obviously, I was happy and smiled and whatnot, photos. But I just walked and walked over, wandered over to the minibus, got in the minibus, went to the camp. All very kind of level-headed. I was obviously knackered. Um, my foot was throbbing quite a lot. But no huge elation or rush or sense of achievement. Now, thinking back on it, the only reason... I can think of in my head was that my mindset for the challenge was so strong because I'd broken my wrist. I nearly didn't have a pair of boots to ice skate in. Um, my bag didn't show up until the last minute. I sprained my ankle. Um, but in my head, there was no way I wasn't going to finish it. Absolutely no chance. So by finishing it, almost all I'd done is done what I expected to do. I can't really think there's any other reason for it other than that. Um, when we got back to base camp, obviously I relaxed a bit and decompressed a little bit and the vodka started flowing as it does. Um, and I did obviously relax a little bit. And certainly after I finished it now, I realised quite what I'd done and um, how hard it was and how brilliant it was at the same time. So... Um, on the uh, presentations, we were also, as well as a medal, we were given a rather nice engraved and painted reindeer antler. Double-sided, of course. Now, this comes from reindeer that actually um, are from the Tassan tribe. I've probably pronounced that completely wrong. But they are on the far reaches, right in the wilderness um, of the lake. And they purposely keep all of their reindeer way 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 away from civilization um because if they get anywhere near they don't want them to catch something they want to keep them healthy so that kind of means something as well for how remote this has been and it kind of adds a memory to that as well as that we were given a 
scarf. So mine happens to be red. Um, and again, this has meaning as well. It um, is a scarf that's a prayer scarf that's given by Buddhists and shamans. And it's sacred and symbolizes thanks for the safe journey. So again, all these different layers and layers of remembering uh, things and how I uh, got on with it. So this place in the challenge, without a doubt, changed me for the better. Jill's got her scarf as well. Well done, Jill. Um, I'm not a spiritual person. I'm not. But something there on this lake is so special and it was felt by everyone there. No one could put their finger on why this was. Um, but everybody felt something was different with this particular race. Doing this race, I learned not to rush in a race, which was a really bizarre thing to say, but not to rush because I'd fall over more. I learned that when I put my mind to it, that I can go through the pain barrier. I gained more self-confidence by pushing my comfort zone and even entering the race. I learned that when you throw a group of like-minded people together and add a little bit of a adversity, then um, everyone helps each other and wants each other to succeed. And also you have a bond that lasts. And then I, without any skill, am actually currently one of the only people in the history of the world to have done this to have skated down this 100 mile lake. And that kind of blows my mind. A year on, I still chat on social media with many of the people there. And again, many of them are here tonight, so thanks for uh, dialing in. Um, I was supposed to be going to Svalbard with a group of them as well, but that got canceled for obvious reasons. So that's happening next year. Um, but more to the point, amongst all of it, I felt I'd done something worthwhile with my life and my time, and I'd managed to get something else in my book, which is important to me, where I write all of my challenges and all of my achievements to kind of prove my self-doubt card has gone. So that's me, and more to the point, to round it all off, you can decide to do it too, because all I've done is decide to do something, and everybody can decide to do whatever they like. So see if anybody else or want, wants to share what they might be up to next. So thank you for listening in. I'm going to do a few questions. I realise I've gone over time slightly and it has been a huge whistle top stop tour. But there's so much stuff I wanted to fit in. Um, but trying to explain what amazing this place is like um, and what the experience was. So I'd like to open it up to questions I haven't answered. Um, just before I do, um, I just say this is one of the few challenges that I've done and I've tried to put them all together, merge them all together with a little bit more history of me personally um, into a, a keynote talk, which I've called my book of full breaths. So if anyone interested in hearing more about that, then please drop me a line. So thank you. Any questions? I will have a look at the chat. Donna tells me there's some cues in there. And Jim, if you're still on, um, obviously feel free to put a link to the Mongol 100 entries registration, which are now open today. So looking through, um, <laughs> Donna, I'm not running a book for finishes on time yet. Well, you won that one. Um, Phil, I'm not sure what you uh, mentioned at the time. Obviously, if you didn't answer it, let me know. <clears throat> So, can anybody actually, while you're while I'm reading now, these could you mind putting on where you're from today? That would be really, really uh, nice to know where everybody's dialing in from. Um, Caroline, yes, I did use a GoPro, I had a GoPro and my uh, phone. It was that cold that the phone died quite quickly, but I kept my phone in my um chest pocket so it kept it warm because in those temperatures, the battery really doesn't last very long at all. Um and hoped that I didn't land on it <laughs> at the same time when I fell over because they were proper Superman splats, some of the uh, falls. The only thing with the GoPro was that uh, obviously the sound was a bit funky and um, there was a lot of moving around. But yes, I did use one of those. Um, Yak um, 
some that you didn't like or were some of the things that were on the uh, ice? I'll be per perfectly honest, I have no idea what there was on. I think there was donkeys or horses, uh, probably horses, because they actually had a race at the ice, uh, the ice festival. They had a proper full on race that they went super fast. Um, thank you, James um, or Jim. Uh, really nice of you to say so. What a pair of ankles, I know. Thank you, Darren, I think that's from. <laughs> um, Jill's going back to skate. Good luck, Jill. Is that March next year? I think Jill's hung, or I've hung. March next year, Jill? Give us a nod. Yeah, thumbs up. Um, I've been talking about it for almost a year when it got postponed. Oh, Caroline, I feel for you. Will it be more like, it'll be more like two by the time I get there in 2021. You will love it and it'll be worth the wait, I promise you. So good luck. How are you doing it, Caroline? You ice skating? Walking? Trekking, good luck. Yeah, that'd be good. Considering the travel challenges you faced, would you go back and do the race again? Ah. The place itself, absolutely amazing i could it's just it's so hard to describe and i don't know if anybody else can um and almost i don't want to spoil that now in england um you guys will know that there was a sport relief thing that nearly went there in february march they ended up going to sahara desert in the end but um in a way i was really looking forward to seeing what the guys did the celebrities did on this program um but in a way as well, I kind of didn't want them to spoil it. I wanted them to do it and see it how I saw it, um, which is really selfish of me. But, um, but yeah, I really did want to see it. But going back and do it again, I don't think I would. I would go back and do something like kayak it or something, something different. I don't like doing things I've already done before. I'm a bit of a kind of I'd like to do different stuff. So I don't think I'd do the race again in that way but I would love to go back there and kayak it or something or even walk around the shore. That'd be brilliant. Like a circumnavigation of it or something like that or swim it. You never know. A bit long way for that. Philip. Great talk, Matt. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, if you need any other questions, Phil, Philip, um, I'm on the, the Facebook thing. So send me whatever you like. Um, what is the food like during this adventure? Well, actually you take your own. So, I'd actually done a few things before that was in um, Norway and I found a make of dehydrated food that was called um, real termat it was called um, and they do like reindeer stew and lamb hot pot and beef they do soups and stuff and that was absolutely amazing uh, really really nice now um, other people had expedition food sachets or packets which again were really really high calories um, and protein things but the food was basically all I brought with me apart from one night the night on the island which I didn't mention because I was kind of fitting it in we had they brought actually a whole reindeer with the Mongolian people in the back of a bus not kidding huge great big reindeer carcass um, in the back of a bus obviously didn't need to worry about it going off because it was frozen solid and then they cut it all up, put it in some huge, great big stew bowls or uh, saucepans, put in some hot rocks into it as well to assist and um, cook that with some cabbage um, and potatoes. And uh, it was really, really good. Um, and there are actually photos I've got of everybody sat around, proper cavemen with great big bones gnawing uh, clean. But um, yeah, that was pretty a pretty good night. Um, stunning place, Derby, yes. Rosendale, Lancashire, California. Hi, Paul. Good to hear from you. Phil's from Falkirk in Scotland. Stratford, hello, Chip. Chip came on another trip with me to Mount Tubcall, which I might do, or we are going to do one about in a few weeks' time. Um, that's really accessible to everybody from the UK and bookable of course through 52 degrees north travel um which is mine and my wife's travel company um laura from romania currently living in qatar oh welcome laura or laura elena sorry oh jill's phone's okay had to be but jill was kind of sat in the bus most of the time and keeping coffee and tea on the go <laughs> no all the crew we did have a number of uh english or um 
visitors, shall we say, to Mongolia crew who are absolutely first class. And again, we're certainly part of the crew, not anything um, different to that. Thank you, Matt. That was amazing. Thank you, Karina. Uh, my Matt has decided he wants to do the next one in 2022. Well done. Go for it. Got to be done. Got to be done. Phil, did you change your base layer into fresh clothing every day or reuse? I have to tell the truth. I use the same stuff the whole time. I'm a bit of a, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I'm afraid, even underwear. <laughs> so I did give them a wash with some water, but I hung them all up in the rafters of the uh, gur. And I was finished as a skater. Most of the time I finished quite early, thankfully, in relative terms. So maybe one, two in the afternoon. So I used a bit of hot water, washed whatever I wanted, or if it started to reek a bit, hung it up in the rafters and it was absolutely bone dry by the morning. Um, and the main reason being is I knew it worked. I didn't want to switch out for anything I had different. I had a short sleeve base layer, like a skin tight one, a merino wool longer one, uh, like a really thin fleece, a Paramo thin fleece, a Paramo wind stopper, all with pit zips in. So um, I felt I could manage my temperature really well with that. And I didn't want to tempt fate because you're on uh, the ice for a long time. Uh, Kerry, how are you doing Kerry? Kerry was one of the skaters or the probably skater. Uh, well done from the USA, thank you very much. Uh, Catherine, really interested in doing this but worried about getting lost. You won't get lost, I promise you. Um, although it, it was really wide and obviously it's a long way, you can't really go wrong. Um, you kind of aim at a peninsula or aim uh, as a skater, we went out first every morning, uh, or most mornings, and there was nine of us, nine skaters. So two of those skaters were really, really good. So they were off, you didn't see them at all. But then, like any race, after 20 minutes, everybody's spread out at their own pace, their own speed. Someone might have had to change their ice skates. Someone might have had to sort out the boot or something. And it gets split out quite, quite a lot. So... Um, but you can't get lost. You can see people in the distance. You can see the tiny little flags in the distance. If you keep going, eventually you will see it. And if there is somewhere dangerous, then they will tell you where that is dangerous. So you can err on the cautious and head left, head left for example, on day three, where the massive seam that we had to go around. And um, we were told to head left um, to get around that. And there's, they, they do their best where they can. They do drive occasionally up and down um the ice what would you take or do differently i think what i would do is i would definitely take some for my level of skill i would take some elbow guards not necessarily anything like super hardcore but something that would actually um save my elbows they puffed up really pretty uh, big i could move my arms still but um yeah that, 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 that would be certainly something that i would take my knees were fine um, but yeah, my, uh, my, knee, my, my elbow pads would be something I would take differently. The only other thing I would do, I don't know, maybe I'd actually listen to, I've got into audio books and podcasts since the lockdown and maybe I'll actually do that and learn something as I'm going along. But honestly speaking, skating, you don't really have the time to do that. You're concentrating the whole time or I was anyway. Um, Chip asked, uh, would I do it again? I answered that one. Um, well done, Matt, and good to see you. Yeah, and you, Brett. Brett was the other top draw skater. Um, plenty of practice before on Wild Lakes, though. I think I actually did Lake Baikal as well. Uh, I'm pretty sure he did. Uh, well, they did. Um, Chip, what's next? Now, that's a big question. There's so many things on my list that is unbelievable. I was meant to be going to Svalbard, like... Um, like I said, that's been moved to next April. I can't decide what to do next. There's so many different things. In my head, I'd love to do, um, this is literally off the top of my head, I would love to do, uh, I'd love to cycle all the way around Iceland. On There's a road that goes all around Iceland I'd love to do. It's about 1,300 kilometres. I'd love to walk the Pembrokeshire path unaided, like with a tent and stuff. That's about 187 miles. Um, you can see I have actually thought about these. 
there's other things on the rat race um, stuff that I'd like to do as well. Um, there's a um, traverse of Iceland next year. They do crazy stuff all over the world that always, I always say, right, I'm not going to, can't do another one, can't do another one. And then I see it, I think, yes, I've got to go and do that. Um, as well as Chip's been badgering me to go to Kilimanjaro, but um, it's a bit normal. It's all a bit normal going there. I mean, I, I'm warming to the idea, I must say, but, but yeah, it's kind of uh, not right at the top of my bucket list at the moment. Um, Donna, yeah, uh, happy to help. Any trips and people want to do, yeah, that's what we do. So we can do all sorts of stuff. Not quite um, race-based, but yeah, you can definitely put to trip. We can put trips together anywhere you uh, you want to go. Do you get quite warm? Yes, I did. Um, on most days, or well, actually on day one, I started with layered mitts. Uh, sorry, layered liner gloves, mitts, uh, my windproof top. Uh, a woolly hat under my helmet and very quickly got super warm and like I said before if you sweat in these kind of conditions it's really not a good idea so I had to make myself stop that I really didn't want to do and uh, take some layers off so someday I actually took the woolly hat off from under my helmet um, which helped a lot didn't wear my mitts at all the rest of the whole four days I just took them off and left them in my bag um, I took off my wind, um, my wind jacket because again, um, without the wind jacket, it could actually get quite cold because the cold wind is blowing through the layers you've got. So you kind of got to manage. You either take your fleece off underneath your wind stopper or leave your wind stopper off, and just you're kind of trying to be a little bit cold on the way. I'm sure you know that, Jill. Anyway, with all the stuff you've done, but. Um, yeah, you're trying to stay just a little bit cold and then you've got layers to put back on. Uh, like Jill says, there's a flag every 10 kilometers, so you really cannot get lost. But I got very warm, um, apart from the last day, which was a lot colder. Kids going to bed. Night, Freddie. <laughs> um, Jill, Patagonia. Yes, that's another option. Um, there is a test pilot trip I've been asking Jim about in November, December time. Um, and I don't know whether there's a space left yet. There's probably not, but that's one of the options as well. But I'm so tempted with all of them and it's just trying to fit them in. For my work, I do golf stuff as well. And all the golf events have been cancelled this year. So that gives me wide open opportunity to kind of do anything. And I really, really don't want to waste it. Because we get into next year and... Um, it uh, could all mean that I can't go anywhere, which is really, really, I'm trying to wangle the Iceland one at the moment with trying to get um, work because obviously that's been moved. But um, um, Patagonia, yeah, Pembrokeshire. Yeah, I love Pembrokeshire. Uh, test, Jill's a test pilot in Iceland. Might see you there, Jill. Um, really enjoyed this. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so good to see your videos. I've got so many more uh, I could bore you all night with. Um, Tanya did the same. Yeah, saw Tanya. Uh, she did well. And that's what inspired me. It's good. That's what it's all about, inspiring people to get outside the front door. Paul James, thanks for sharing the experience, Matt. It's great to learn. Makes me want to do it even more. Yeah, get for it. Get up and go for it. Tanya, also with us in Namibia. Namibia, yeah. Um, Donna's had to go. You need to put mini Nixons to bed. Uh, really good insight to it. Thank you, Caroline. And Alistair, thank you, Matt. All the best for future adventures. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Caroline says, looking forward to seeing you in 2021. Jill, Tanya and I met in Australia, where I was living until a few months ago. Oh, what a, what a place to be. So if anybody's got any more um, um, questions, and I don't know if anybody wants to uh, take it off mute or not. So anybody can have a chat who actually was around or not around. Um, I'll try and scroll through the video things. Give us a thumbs up if anybody wants to. Try and scroll through the videos. But everybody put the thumbs up. Anybody want to have a go now? Jill put her hand up. Jill's put her hand up. I think you're the only one, Jill, from what I can see. Oh, beer calling, everybody's got. So, um, Jill.
Jill, we'll have to catch up another time. Got beer as well. Well done. <laughs> but um, really great for you to um, come in. I'm going to send some feedback through um, by email. Um, probably be tomorrow. So I'd really be appreciate if you could just click on some dots on that and put a couple of lines together for a bit of a testimonial. That would be fantastic. Brett's here in the room. So I'll switch... Um, Brett and Jill on and they can have a chat and everybody else thank you very much for attending if you're wanting to um, join in the Mount Topical one I'll send the message around everybody and um, Mount Topical one will be something that you can definitely get involved in um, uh, and it's a really good adventure to do as well thank you good night